morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. It's uh, great to be praising the Lord today. I'm super excited for our songs this morning and getting in the word of prayer with God, especially in these tough times. It's important that we praise his name, not just on Sundays, but every day of the week. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to lead us in a quick prayer this morning. Dear Lord, I ask that you please bless all of us here on the other side of the screen, Father, and know that everything's okay and that to get through this tough time, we need you, Lord, and we should be able to call upon your name, Father. I ask that you please bless this earth, Lord, for it is temporary. We will one day be with you in heaven, Father. And I ask that you please allow us to receive a great message today. In your name we pray, amen. Stand and praise the Lord this morning. And I searched the world, but He couldn't fill me. The man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. I shot this out, but then you came along. He put me back and put me back together. Yes, you did, God. And every desire is now satisfied. But hearing you love, oh, there's nothing. Shout it out, there's nothing better. The whole there's nothing. The better than you, Lord, there's nothing. The better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Amen. No, I'm not. No, I'm not afraid to show you, to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. Yes, you're the God. Amen. Cause you're, cause you're the God of the mountains. It's the God. It's the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace it won't find me again. Shout it out, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. But better than you, oh, there's nothing. But better than you, oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Shout it out, there's nothing better. Let's all stand and proclaim this. Oh, there's nothing but better than you. Oh, there's nothing but better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. Let's go. You turn morning to dancing. You give. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one. You're the only one who can. You turn morning. You turn morning to death. You give beauty. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame. You turn shame into glory. You're the only. You're the only one who can. You turn grace into God and shout out. Turn grace into God. You turn bones, you turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one. You're the only one who can. There's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing, cry out, cry out. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you, oh, there's nothing. There's nothing better, nothing better, oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn grace into God and shut it out. 
turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into harvests. You're the only one who can. You turn graves. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. Turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one. You're the only one. You're the only one. You're the only one who can. Let's go ahead and just shout this out. All there's nothing. Turn graves into gardens. Shout it out. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only, the only one who can. You turn graves. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. The only one who can. The only one who can. Give a shout of praise. Amen. 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 God is good. God is good.
seem that one more time. I'm Pastor Robert. So great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Just want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel North Whittier, 10 a.m. service. Whether you're joining us on Facebook or Instagram, we're all together in the spirit. So this now this at this time this morning, it is time for our responsive reading. So let's go ahead and open up to Psalm 95. And while you're doing that, I'd just like to share a couple of things. I want to remind you, if anyone out there needs any type of prayer request whatsoever, don't hesitate to reach out to us and connect with us. You could always contact Pastor Charlie, myself, or Rebecca for any type of prayer request. Just remember that we are constantly praying for all of you out there. So let's go ahead and turn to Psalms 95. And how that works, if there's anyone new watching, I'll start us off on the odd number of verses. And as I keep on reading through, you hop in on the even number of verses. Read them out aloud. Okay. Psalm 95 reads, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was aggrieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Amen. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you this morning, Lord God, that we're able to gather via online in the spirit, Lord. There is a church open in every household, Lord. You're doing a great, mighty thing, Lord. So I just ask that you guide us by your sovereign hand, Lord. We exalt you. We lift you high in the highest seat in heaven, Lord. Lord, just be with us this morning. Be with Pastor Charlie. Anoint him in his message this morning, Lord God. So many will hear the word, Lord, and they will repent, turn from their sins, and follow you. Join us on that narrow path that leads to your kingdom, Lord. In the powerful name of Christ, we all say, amen and amen.
sing this song and just dwell in God's presence right now. We're all thirsty for God, for more of God. We stand here and just thirst. We stand before God wanting more. And it's right before us, and God just tells us, Take a step of faith. Take a step of faith. So God, will you just develop a household within, within us, God, of grace and love. Not only you can understand, God, but you speak to us now, Father. Find us where we're at and speak to us, God. We invite your holy presence to this place, God to come and restore our lives, Father. Would you restore us now? Would you restore us now, Father, and use this time? We love you with all we have, God. This life is hard. You, you went through it, God. You went through it for the worst. For my sin, God, you died on the cross for my sin. And all we're here to do is just live this life and follow God. God, would you help us? Would you help us, Father? Come tree from the well that never runs dry. The goatee and let love teach you to fly. There is rest here in the arms of Christ And all who seek shall find If you're thirsty, cry out If you're thirsty The Spirit of the bright say come Oh, come Oh, come There's mercy it doesn't matter what you've done. Oh, come. Oh, come. But just breathe. Let peace take over your soul. Cause whatever you need, the heart of God is in control, is in control, is in control. There is rest, but there is rest here in the arms of Christ, and all who seek shall find. If you're thirsty, cry out. If you're thirsty, the spirit in the bright say come, oh come, oh come. There's mercy, it doesn't matter what you've done, oh come, oh. There's healing, there's healing, and there's freedom, there's more than enough for everyone. There's healing, there's freedom, there's more than, there's more than life. There's healing, there's freedom, there's more than enough for everyone. There's healing, there's freedom, so we come, and so we come. Lord, we come, and Lord, we come. Lord, we come, Lord, we come, Lord, we come. We're thirsty. We're thirsty. Your spirit in the right say, come, oh, come, come, oh, come. There's mercy. It's all because
because of what you've done. Oh, come, oh, come. Now we're just so thirsty for your spirit, God. Spirit in the bride, God, we say to come. And we invite you, God, to come into our lives, God, to use us. Without you, God, we're nothing. Would you find us now, God? We're thirsty, God, for more of you. We're thirsty. We mess up, God. We're human. We mess up all the time, God mistakes here and there. You are faithful, God. You are faithful, God. You are merciful, God. You take that sin and say, it's no longer. You say, it's no longer there, God. You cast it away, Father. Would you cast our sin away, God? Would you create, you create a new man in me, God? We're thirsty. We're thirsty, your spirit in the bright say come, oh come, oh come. There's mercy, it doesn't matter what you've done, oh to my rescue, God. You came to my rescue, God, when I was gone, when I was out doing what I want to do, God. You came. You found me, Father. In the midst of my sin, God, you said, I'm here for you, son. I'm here for you, daughter. I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to show you what this is all about. It's all about growing and being in our, in our Father. Our God saved us. Our God came to save God. And would you save me now, God, by your blood? That's what brings us all together is your blood, Father. You came, Father. You came when I called, God. You restored my heart. Would you restore us now, God? And I call. You answered, and you came to my rescue, and I just want to be where you are. I called, you answered, I called. You answered, and you came to my rescue, and I just want to be where you are, I want to be where you are, I call, you answered.
Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, what beautiful worship the Lord has given us. I hope you can sense the spirit, even if it is through social media. Um, we're so blessed to have uh, our committed worship team. I just want to thank the Lord and, and give thanks and publicly say what a blessing they are. They work very hard and they practice and uh, they're very committed to what they do. And it shows, doesn't it? So thank the Lord for our, our worship team, and we're looking forward to, to, to continued great things the Lord's going to do in and through them. Well, we're back to 1 Corinthians. Uh, if you guys, how many of you remember being in 1 Corinthians? I think it was before the end of the year, before Christmas time. We went into the Christmas season and then went into the current season that we're in with all the um, distractions of the COVID situation. So um, now we're back going to where the Lord had originally put us in 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 7, and I want to um, give you a moment to turn there in your Bibles. And some of you may remember that um, a little bit of the background that we discussed. in At Corinth, um, Paul wrote a letter to them because he had heard some things that were concerning to him from the house of Chloe. And uh, she had told him, hey, some things are off there at Corinth, at the church. They're doing some things that are kind of concerning. So this letter that Paul writes to the church is a letter of correction. And do you remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? We covered it so, so many weeks ago. And that was he told them, you guys are, you guys are carnal. You guys are carnal Christians. And that word carnal and your, in your Bible may say fleshly, but the original language is sarkakos, which is you're given over to your fleshly appetites, and that's destructive to the spirit. And so, do you remember why they got to that point where they were carnal? Do you remember the, the background in the city of Corinth in which they lived and what was happening? Corinth was one of the largest seaports around and it was an isthmus where people can come in uh, along the trade routes and stop and unload all their goods. The problem with that is you had sea people come in, you know, the Navy people would come in, the, the various military people would come in to town. You would have sales people, people that were selling their goods, and sailors and traders and various world travelers. Corinth was famous for their sales of uh, metal trinkets and pottery and very fine leather. As a matter of fact, you may have heard the term uh, when someone's talking about a, a real fine leather, they, they'll use the term even till today, Corinthian letter, leather. So you would go to Corinth and it was very much like these open markets where people would be selling their goods. I remember one time when we were in uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand, um, it's very much like that. During the day, it's hustle and bustle, and then as soon as the nights come, the, the sellers come out, and the people are making food, and the trinkets, and the artistry, and all the crafts, and it's unbelievable. If the, you can barely walk in the streets as people are selling their goods 
Uh, it truly is like a cultural type of celebration. And again, because of its location, uh, Corinth was a major financial uh, business area. There was a lot of business and transactions happening in Corinth. Also, upon the hill overlooking Corinth was called the Acropolis. The Acropolis is uh, this hill where the temple Aphrodite was set up. And the Aphrodite, as you may know, is the goddess of sensuality and sexuality. And at every evening, the temple prostitutes and priestess would come into the city of Corinth and sell themselves in service to Aphrodite. And you can imagine how things would fare within the seaport town of Corinth. Fortunately, those things that were all around Corinth were tending to creep within the church. And the church started struggling with these fleshly, carnal, sarcaicos type of things in their lives because of what was all around them. In fact, in Paul's day, if you were referring to, like today we would say, party animal. Well, that person's really a party animal. Back in those days, they would say, oh, that person's like a Corinthian. In other words, they really get down with their partying. And as a result, the city was steeped within immorality. The church, and it was creeping within the church as well. First Corinthians can be divided into two parts. Chapters 1 through 6 is really Paul exhorting them and and, uh, speaking to them from his heart and encouraging them to do better within their relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul's dealing with the things that he heard that are happening in Corinth. And as a pastor, he's lovingly exhorting them. He's correcting them. Remember, we covered a few of those things. They were stumbling each other with their various um, liberties, They were causing divisions. They were following man and not Jesus. There were Christians that were suing each other. And there was great immorality and sin. Now chapters 7 through 16, which we're beginning today, that's part 2 of the sections of Corinth. And you have these uh, practical questions as, as the Corinthians are responding back to Paul and they're writing a letter back to him asking him, Hey, practical questions like, hey, Paul, what about this and what about that? So it's kind of like uh, Bible answer man time as, as they're asking Paul these questions as they deal with the culture around them. And that's where we, where we open up this morning. Let's move ahead in part two of uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, Paul says... It is good for a man not to touch a woman. So let me just give you a heads up here. What we're going to get into in the next uh, few minutes here is Paul is going to give us marriage counseling. Paul, we're going to get some great insight about divorce and the marriage relationship. But Paul also is going to give us some great insight into the single life. And so if you're single or if you're married, um, whether you're going to be married, uh, this would be great information and encouragement for you as well. So pay attention to what the Lord is telling us because no matter what stage we are in our marriage, these are good things to, to get under our foundation to strengthen our relationships, okay? So Paul says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. The first, the first question that Corinthians have to Paul is about marriage and singleness and like, what do we do, Paul? You know, in this day and age, can, can we go out with that person? Can we have intimate relationships? And Paul says, it's good for a man not to touch him. And what he's saying here is sexually. It's good for a young man, a single man, not to touch a woman sexually. When the culture is given over to an anything-goes type of sexual environment, like very much today, that value of real love, of meaningful love, becomes polluted. And, and it's always, in my mind, it's always identified by the music that we listen to. In, in my day, back in the 80s, 
you know, I remember my mom saying, turn, turn that music off. And, and we thought that music was bad. You guys remember like uh, Culture Club, right? You know, do you really want to hurt me? Or, uh, you know, one of those, you know, and we thought th- that music was bad. Compared to today, you, you never thought it could get so illicit. And, and it's just a, a microcosm of the culture that we live in today. And it's true that art imitates life. You think of some of the songs written about love in the past. I want to know what love is. Or what's love got to do with it? Tainted love. Or the love shack. I know that's some of you guys' favorite songs. B-52s. Don't take me back there. Don't take me back. Rock Lobster. Looking for love in all the wrong places. That's a really pathetic song. But the culture, guys, these are all identifiers of the culture that is really looking for love. Authentic love. Who doesn't want real love? And in the pursuit of that love, you have these idiots out there say, hey, come on, baby, I'll show you what love is. And, 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 and oftentimes, we fall for those things within the culture. And it's a big, fat lie. When I've had opportunities to counsel young people, young adults, single people, and even, even those that have been married and caught up, got caught up in adultery, when you, when, you, when you counsel with them and there's this godly sorrow, you can see the darkness in their eyes of the hurt that sexual sin brings into their lives. But our, our culture is on a quest for love, but it's polluted love because God is love. And if, you're, if you find anything out there that is not connected to God, it's not love. And it seems not, no matter how long ago or how ancient the times were back in Corinth, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So Paul's counsel here is for the single person. It's good for a single man. It's good for a single woman not to touch that other person sexually. Paul is saying it's good for that man to withhold and to remain a virgin or that girl to remain a virgin. In other words, we're not to be identifying with what the culture is all about. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Verse 2, Paul says, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. In other words, Paul says, hey, if you really want to go that route and, 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 and experience that wonderful experience of the sexual relationship that God created, by the way, he says, then get married. There's a great danger of sexual sin when we're single. And I want to encourage you guys that are single, no matter how, whether you're a young adult or you're in a dating relationship, or you're divorced and you happen to be single, or whatever the case may be, beware. It's been 30 years since I've been a single man. (laughs) 30 years, oh my gosh. But here's one thing I've learned that I want to share with you. With both singles and marrieds, and I think you'll agree with this, that when you're dating, and you're, you're single and you're dating, Satan tries to do everything that he can to get you to have sexual relationship. He pulls out every trick in his bag to get you to come together before you're married. But when you're married, he pulls everything out of his bag and all his tricks to do everything he can to keep you from being sexually active with your spouse. That's his, that's his MO. That's what he does. And those of you that are married know what I'm talking about. Paul says, because of the dangers of sexual sin, that because of sex outside of marriage, how it damages our relationship with Christ, marriage is is the better way to go. True love is not going to defile yourself or somebody else. Verse 3, let the husband render to his wife 
the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. This due affection is speaking of that sexual intimacy. And don't you love how just the Bible gets down to brass tacks here? You know, the Bible doesn't blush. It covers all these issues plain and open for all of us to hear and to see. Thank God for that. Someone says, well, you shouldn't be talking about those things in the church. It's in the Bible. So do affection. Paul is encouraging those that are married to meet each other's intimate needs. Paul says, don't withhold from your spouse. There's a due affection of love and intimacy that is owed. It's owed. It's due from the husband to the wife and from the wife to the husband. This is a, a marriage. This is what a marriage that is aligned with God and what God's word says does. This is God's design for us to come into the marriage with a servant-hearted perspective. I'm coming into the marriage, oh, I'm not going to change that guy, right? That's not the right attitude to go into the marriage. We're going to the marriage because I'm going to serve. I'm going to be other-centered. The danger in the marriage, and there's great danger in the marriage when we hold back from our spouses as many will weaponize the sexual relationship and use it against their spouse or withhold it against their spouse. Verse four. The wife, this is a trip here for some of you that haven't gone down this route before. Look look what he says. The wife does not have authority over her own body. Some of the guys say, yeah, that's right. (laughs) But it goes on to say, but the husband does. I like that, man. Yeah, right on. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. That puts a big, fat, gaping hole in feminism. Because feminism says, it's my body. I can do with it what I want, not according to the word of God. Not according to the Holy Spirit through Apostle Paul. It is not your body and you can't do whatever you want with it. Because our bodies are in the marriage are given over to the spouse. I'm no longer in charge of my body. I give it to my spouse. The Bible is not very politically correct, is it? This is among other teachings in the Bible that flies in the face of what our culture says today. Marriage by definition, guys, listen to this. Marriage by definition, I always talk to, in our premarital sessions, I tell people, here's you, and here's your spouse, your prospective spouse, and marriage is leaving behind your life. You're now leaving behind your identity, and you're becoming one with that person. And that's the biblical you know, explanation of the the marriage that honors God. You're no longer me, now you become we. And that's how God has designed it. In Genesis 2.24, the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, leave, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So many problems in the marriage come from the fact that there's no leaving and there's no cleaving. I know that because I was guilty of that when we first got married. Without giving you all my story, nobody wants to hear all my whole story, I was a mijitito tied to the apron strings of my mom. And hey, I admit it, I still am in many senses, but... I had a problem with leaving. And therefore, I wasn't leaving, you know, and my, my beautiful, lovely bride would make a wonderful dish and I would say, well, my mom kind of made it like that, you know. It's kind of like, no, don't don't leave, leave that behind and cleave to your wife. And unfortunately, it took me a while to learn. I finally learned um, 
But that word cleave, it means to be glued. It means to be literally become one. We leave our paths behind, our our prior identities of, hey, I used to go out with the four-wheel driving. And, and for me, it was always, you know, playing golf. Well, I would play golf like three times, sometimes four times a week. I would even lie about playing golf. But when I got married, I had other priorities. Well, I should have had other priorities. And I'd go to, go, I'd go to get my clubs and I'd find that they were missing they were hidden. They were put away somewhere. And finally, I got the idea. It took a while, and it caused problems. Because, guys, you just can't go out shooting wherever you want to go shooting or four-wheel driving or doing those hobbies that you were used to doing because now you have to consider your wife. You're lovely. And, hey, if she loves those things too, all, all the better. Leaving and cleaving, and we're not doing that we're not honoring the biblical concept of the marriage or our wives or our prospective husbands. Sexual intimacy is not, as the world says, two bodies coming together. According to the Bible, sexual intimacy is two spirits coming together. And it is very pure. And it's very beautiful. And it's very much unlike what the world thinks it is. It's connecting the spirit, the other person's spirit, a true coming together of body and spirit. So when we enter the marriage contract, we, we enter this bond of unity that is totally other-centered. It's totally about how can I make your life better, my dear. To be self-serving and to go in the marriage and think I'm going to change that man, change that woman, is to only go into the marriages with your eyes wide shut. Most marriages fail because of expectations that aren't being met. But when we go in understanding the biblical concept and we're both, you know, working towards that biblical concept of marriage, there's still going to be friction. It's not going to be perfect, but you're rowing in the same direction. There's nothing worse than when you're rowing one direction and she's rowing the other direction and you're just going in circles. Verse 5. Paul says, Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But the King James says it in a totally more poetic way. In 1 Corinthians 7, 5, in the King James, says, defraud ye not the other, except to be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fashion and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. What Paul is saying here, guys, is when a husband, when a wife, when a spouse withholds and weaponizes the sexual intimacy, you're defrauding them. You're ripping them off. We are to give ourselves to one another. Not what we deem is what they need, but according to their desires and to their needs. Now, of course, there has to be a balance there. That can't be out of balance. There can't be something done that's going to be hurtful or harmful. We're, not, we're talking within the context of balance and scripture and the spirit. Nobody should be forced to do something that they don't want to do. That's not what we're talking about here. But that's God's plan for marriage. It's a, it's a total others-centeredness. So to all my, and then he goes on to say, by the way, and there, the time for the spouses to, to come apart and not be given over to sexual intimacy is for the time of consecration, prayer, drawing to the Lord. So there is a time to have a break. Verses six through seven. But I say this is, this as a concession. In other words, Paul says, this is my counsel. I'm not, not saying thus saith the Lord, I'm just kind of giving you my advice. This is not as a commandment. For I wish that all 
men were even as I myself. In other words, I think all men should, if you find yourself as a single man, Paul says, I think personally you should just stay single. But each one has his own gift from God. One is uh, one in this manner and another in that. So Paul says here as a suggestion, it might be better for you to consider being single. But not everybody has the gift of singleness. Now, we know that Paul was married at one time. Uh, right around Acts 26, the Bible tells us that Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin. Well, a, a, an order to be a part of the Sanhedrin, was like, which was like the um, Jewish Supreme Court. Um, you had to be married. And we know that Paul was a part of that Sanhedrin. So at one point in time, we know Paul was married. Whether his wife died or left him because he became a Christian, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say what Paul is saying here, though, is that, hey, if you can be single and you can handle it, be single. Many cultures put a stigma on singleness. Like if that person is, is uh, you know, kind of um, incomplete. Even the church is guilty of that at times. You know, I, I was a pastor of an adult singles ministry, so... I know this very well. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody, but many churches will have these events for the families or for um, the marrieds. And it's kind of like the singles fall in the gap there. And it happens often. We don't do that here at Calvary Chapel North Whittier. And I think it's because of that background that I have as far as being a singles pastor um, and working with adult singles, I, I, I think that adult singles are the horsepower of the church. I remember I took a group with me to Thailand, as I was talking about earlier, and man, these, these guys and gals were dedicated to the work of ministry where over, over 125 people from youngsters to older people got saved. It was a miraculous, it was kind of like being on Survivor Island, to tell you the truth. It was a tough trip, and they signed up for it. Every one of them was a single person, with the exception of one, actually. The singles community are not a second-class citizens. They are the, the horsepower of the, and the foundation of our churches. They're the ones that are willing to step up because they don't have the other priorities of the, of the family or the spouse. And boy, we appreciate that here at Calvary Chapel North Whittier. So Paul says, hey man, you know, if you, if you can, I think personally you should just stay single if you, that's where you find yourself. Verse 8 and 9. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them to remain as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control... Let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And the reality is, not everybody has the gift of singleness. And that's okay, Paul says. He says, you know, I have the gift of singleness, Paul says. He says, but not everybody does. And that's okay. Verse 10. Now, to the married I command, yet not I, the Lord. Now he switches from Here's my counsel, here's my advice, here's my to thus, thus saith the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. So Paul is saying here in the Christian marriage, there is no room for divorce. But he goes on to say, if it does happen... And it does. We all know this. If it does happen, then that person should remain unmarried or be reconciled back to their spouse. Do you see any other option here? There's no other option. Matthew 19.8 says, Jesus says to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. You know, God hates divorce. And that is something that we as Christians 
should not be engaging in. But it does happen. And Paul's advice at that point is, um, if that happens, that that person is to remain unmarried. A rabbi named Earl Grohlman once said he believed that divorce was even more traumatic than death. He said, the big difference is with death, there's closure. It's over. With divorce, it's never over. Paul says that the Lord's command is that if a woman or a man happen to divorce, they are to either remain single or reconcile. That's something to pray about. That's something to look to the Lord about. Now, we're going to qualify that as we move forward. Verse 12. But to the rest, I, this is Paul again saying, this is what I say. Paul again saying, here's my advice. If any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. In other words, if you're living in that situation, and that is a difficult situation when you're married to an unbeliever, it, it happens. It can be very difficult. Some of you are in that situation. Paul's advice is, if that person is willing to stay married, then you should stay married to that person. For, verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. That word sanctified is not saved, but it's to be set apart. In other words, the blessing of that believing spouse overflows into the life of that unbelieving spouse. And who knows, that could lead them to the Lord and to salvation. We've seen that happen many times. Verse 14 continued, Look, this is so wise of Paul. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. In other words, is there, if there's a divorce and your children have to go live part-time with the unbeliever, who's, who's going to get harmed the most? The children. But if you stay in the home, and if, because that unbeliever is willing to stay in the home, you get to stay in the home, and the home is complete, and you get to raise your children. If you divorce the unbelieving spouse, it's going to create problems with the children. And by the way, it's the children who suffer when it comes to divorce. Everybody suffers. Children suffer the most. Verse 15. But if an unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. In other words, Paul's saying, okay, here's the deal. If you're a believer and you're married to an unbeliever and they don't want to be with you, you're free. You can you could divorce that person. If the unbeliever departs, so many times in cases of abandonment, many times in cases of you know, I believe also that that would include, even though that person says that, um, even if they declare themselves to be a believer, but they're abusive or they're threatening, they're causing threatening to the wives or their family, I also believe that that is a case for abandonment and, and, and divorce. So you're not, I don't believe the, love, the Lord would have you be in a marriage that is abusive and that is a threat to you or to the spouse or to the children. And I believe the scriptural foundation for that is right here. If, if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. God has, Paul says here, that God has not called us to bondage, but of peace. I found a story of a woman married 30 years and she was asked, in your 30 years of marriage, have you ever considered divorce? And she replied, no, 
Not in all my 30 years. I have never considered divorce. Murder? A few times. <laughs> and, you know, within the marriage, there's going to be rough spats, and those things happen from time to time. But we're never looking for an excuse. Christian, we're never looking for an excuse. Divorce should never be on our hearts, our minds as Christians. It just is not biblical for the Christian to divorce unless it's within these confines that we discussed. So what are those confines? Let me just clarify. So you, let me give you three scriptural instances that I see in the Bible that allows for the bond of marriage, and it is a bond, it is a contract before the Almighty to be broken. Okay? Three reasons, three scriptures. 1 Corinthians 7.15, if the unbelieving spouse abandons the marriage, and again, as I said, I personally believe that would include being under threat of harm or abuse. The second is under death, in Romans 7.2. And the third is adultery, Matthew 19.9. In that case, you are free and clear. But again, even in the worst cases, God can heal. God can restore. Divorce should be really not even the last consideration. And, and then when it does finally happen, and it is considered, let's see how we do that. Okay, let's move on. Verse 16, for how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? The story that I wanted to share with you as I get ready to close here. So this reminds me so much of mine and Eileen's story. How many years ago, I gave Eileen all kinds of reasons to, to leave me. By the grace of God, she stuck with me, but I kept being a tonto. I kept doing those things. I kept drinking it up and carousing and hanging out in places that I shouldn't have been in. And, and you know what I'm talking about. It's that fog of sin that we just lose our way. And I did all of that in the guise of being a Christian. Thinking that I, I was a Christian, but I was anything but. I was self-serving. But Eileen gave me a chance. And she also told my parents. <laughs> got me in a lot of trouble. But thank God she did. She did Eileen did everything that she could to save our marriage. She was committed to that. And although I wasn't, she was. And God gave me great grace. God saved me. God saved our family. He saved our marriage. I look at her today with just great love and adoration because she stuck to it. She didn't give up. Then God gave us charge of this beautiful church. Guys, I didn't plan on being a pastor. I became a pastor because once God saved me, like really got a hold of my life at this time and took me out of that direction of losing everything. When once he saved me, I just said, okay. Once I got to that place of sobriety and clarity, and feeling God in my life again and having my family restored plus two more children added to our family I just said I'm yours my life is not my own anymore Lord whatever you want whatever you do and then he calls me into the ministry why because of amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me and it's out of great love and my response to the Lord that I give him my life. As a result today, as we get to have the privilege of pastoring our church, those two children that the Lord added to us after our problems are now our worship leaders. 
You couldn't have planned that any better, could you? When it could have easily have gone the other direction. When it could have easily have gone with me being booted out and having a contentious life with my family. We were a decision away from calamity befalling our lives. But God saw fit by his grace and putting that into the heart of my wife to save our family. Church, we must give God the opportunity to save. Many times we talk about salvation and grace that comes from God and it is great and it is wonderful. But what about the grace that we need to give to each other? Some of you are a decision away from destruction or a decision away from restoration. And you choose don't bail out hang in there I was there too I know what that's like stay put and allow God the time to do the work that only he can and what a work he can do if you just give him the time and the grace and the opportunity. I leave you with this verse, 1 Corinthians 2.9. It is written that I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. Stay the course, my friend. Stay strong in the Lord. Give great grace, even at the moment when it's all falling apart. Because remember, it falls apart in his hands, and he can put it right back together, as he did in my life and so many others, only by the great grace of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word from the Apostle Paul, and it's, it's encouraging to know that you can put our lives back together. Lord, we come together often and we have these great plans and dreams and they're dashed because somebody makes a bad decision or somebody turns on their family. We've seen it from time and time again. But we've also seen many of those become restored because truly we serve the God of a second chance. If we could only give that chance to our spouses or maybe another relationship, our children or our parents. God, you're the God of the second chance. You're the God of restoration. Help us to try to be as gracious and merciful as you have been to us. We ask you, God, to heal the marriages. Heal those that are hurting and struggling. Help us, Lord, to have marriages that are based upon your word and not what the culture is doing or saying. We want to be followers, God, in our lives, as singles, as marrieds, as children of God that are following after your precepts because, Lord, you have great plans prepared for us. We don't even know. And eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor, enter is, nor has entered into the, the heart or the mind of man the things that you have prepared if we only stay the course. Help us, Lord, to seek out your mercy. And this morning, I want to pray for those right now.
that are watching this message here. If they're struggling in the marriage, Lord, if that's you and you're with your spouse right now or maybe you're not, would you stand with me right now? Would you stand? I want to pray for you. Father, you know this man. You know this woman. You know this marriage. You know the situation, Lord. And you are God over everything. You are healer over all. And there is nothing too impossible for you, Lord. If we could only give great grace as we've received it, Lord. I ask you, Lord, that you move in this marriage. That you move in these lives. That you touch these people that have responded today. And would you pray with me this prayer right now? Father, come into my heart and life and pour out your grace. I need it, Lord. I've, I'm empty on grace. I've given that person chance after chance after chance. I'm asking you to give me the grace to give to my husband or my wife or my child or my mom because it's truly the enemy that comes in to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's a work of Satan. But we declare by the mighty name of Jesus Christ that you will heal our families that you will heal our marriages, God. We believe you for that. We trust you for that, Lord. We have no place else to go. We have nothing else we can do. But we claim the blood of Jesus Christ upon our homes and upon our family and upon our marriages. Would you empower us, Lord, by your spirit and would you strengthen us, God, I want to see wonders in my marriage. I want to see wonders in my children and in my family, God. And only you can do that. I'm at that place where I've tried everything and I'm ready to give up. But oh, by the grace of God, I know you can do it, Lord. I believe you can do it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we call to Jesus. I call. to my rescue. 
ask you and I just want to be where you are. I want to be where you are. We want to be where you are. I want to be where you are. We want to be where you Amen. So help us, Lord, not to be carnal, sarcastic. Teach us to be other centered. Draw us near to you, Lord. I just thank the Lord for the many blessings that He's bestowed upon me, just, just like Pastor Charlie. I wasn't looking to be a, a pastor or anything like that. He plucked me out of my mire as well. He also blessed me. I like Char Pastor Charlie liked to golf. And he blessed me with a wife that loves to golf too. So that's pretty awesome. So I want to go ahead and uh, before we pray for the offering, I just want to go ahead and remind you as part of our worship, let's not forget to give. And there's three ways that you could do that. So I'm going to explain those to you real quickly. The first way is by mailing in your tithe or offering to P.O. Box 2771, Bassett, California, 91746. The second way to do that would be to simply text the word GIVE to 562-991-6976. And then the third and final way to do it is just drive by the church. Drop it through the, the drawer or through the door. Just slip it through the door there or through the door rather. And uh, we'll pick it up. Okay, so let's go ahead and pray for the offering real quickly. 
Lord God, we thank you for your steadfast love and mercy on us, Lord. Father, we believe that every word in the Bible was breathed out by you. And we believe your promise that you will bless us when we are obedient to your word. And so, without hesitation, we gladly give to you what is rightly yours. Bless these tithes and offerings, Father. May we give with a joyous heart. We love you, Lord. In the powerful name of Christ Jesus, we all say amen and amen. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up Nicole now for the rest of the announcements. Good morning. Good morning, church family. There we go. All right, so just a few announcements. Just want to make sure that everyone's staying connected. Are you connected with us through our bulletin app? If you want to get into the know, all you need to do is simply text BLTNCCNW to 41411, and that will get you connected. Also, please check out our Facebook or bulletin app for a video that Teacher Sylvia did for our kids club. Friends, ages two to six, and it is so cute. And also, we're having our men's and women's and young adults Zoom devos uh, starting next week, so please check our Facebook or bulletin app for instructions on that. And also for the youth, uh, Miss Sandra will be uploading a YouTube video this weekend that will be on Facebook. And, uh, you know, just to close out with worship, and what a great morning. Um, church, let's just continue being the church. Amen? Thank you. Praise the Lord this morning. Amen. And I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty, the man's empty praise and treasure and faith. The heart never enough. Then you came along, but then you came along. And put me back, and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied. But here in love, oh, there's nothing to cry out. Oh, there's nothing but better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you, oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Nothing better, nothing better. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. But better than you, oh, there's nothing. But better than you, oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn grace into garden. You turn graves into God. You turn bones into army. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves. You turn graves into God. You turn bones into army. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one. You're the only one who can. You're the only one. You're the only one who can. Have a great week. God bless everybody. Be blessed. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining Calvary Chapel North Whittier today. We appreciate you uh, coming out and checking us out. Uh, also, if you pray to receive Jesus Christ, 
We want to let we want to know. We want to help you on that journey. So definitely contact us. Also, uh, know that we're praying for you. We're praying for our church family, asking the Lord uh, just for blessings during these times. And if, if there's anything that uh, we can help with or serve you in any specific way, by all means, reach out to us. And thank you again for joining us. God bless you. We love you, and we look forward to seeing you soon.